Ja, jag kanske nu kommer att börja sätta ihop orden lite. Jag tror att det blir bäst. Då står jag liksom på kanten. Okay, everyone. So, did everyone find their seats? Perfect. Uh, welcome to today's seminar. Uh, my name is uh, Alexandra Ivanov, and I have the pleasure to moderate this session. Uh, just briefly, I would like to mention that I previously worked in the European Parliament as a political advisor to the Swedish EPP delegation, uh, Gunnar Hörsmark. And I also worked uh, with the Jarl Jarmusson Foundation and their work in Belarus. Um, today I am a political advisor to Ulf Christensen, uh, the party leader of the Moderate Party. Uh, and uh, today's topic of this seminar is a Europe without political prisoners. We are going to talk about the state of human rights in the Eastern Europe. We're going to uh, changes oh. are coming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, can you still hear me? Uh, noise is changing. Yeah, it's still on. Okay, perfect. Uh, and we're going to talk about the state of human rights in the east of Europe, and specifically about uh, political prisoners and the rule of law, uh, and within that, the possible uh, passes forward and how to improve the situation. And I really want to underline that since we have such a distinguished audience here today, we will have time for questions at the end. So don't worry about it and uh, uh, prepare yourselves. Today I have the pleasure uh, of welcoming uh, three um, persons with uh, great uh, experience and knowledge of opposition works in different countries. Uh, we have Alexander uh, Solovyov. Solo 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 yes, okay. uh, chairman of Open Russia, who has a political background in Russia as advisor to the Duma uh, deputy uh, Dmitry Gudkov. Uh, and Open Russia today, as most of you probably know, supports and provides legal assistance to political prisoners in Russia as well as their families, which is an important part of the work as well. We have uh, Dim uh, Andrei Dmitriev, uh, co-chairman of Tell the Truth Movement in Belarus. Uh, Andrei uh, was uh, himself detained uh, by Belarusian KGB uh, in connection with the protest against the election falsification in 2010. You have extensive political experience from Belarus uh, and uh, also participated in the parliamentary elections last year. Uh, and uh, it should be underlined that the result of that election was not recognized by the OSSE due to the high level of rigging. And last but not least, we have Gigi Ugala Ugalava, a former mayor of Tbilisi, uh, who also as well has been arrested in Georgia uh, while being the campaign chief of the opposition UNN party, uh, only four days before the crucial, at that time, runoff to the mayor elections. Uh, Gigi also uh, was pre-trial uh, detention, was declared unconstitutional by the Georgia Constitutional Court, and although uh, Mr. Ugalava was released, was re-arrested uh, the same, th within one day. <coughs> uh, earlier this year, finally, uh, was released and is currently serving uh, as the Secretary General of the Opposition Party, uh, European Georgia. I want to start with uh, saying a big thank you for all of you of being here today uh, and thank making you. this uh, seminar possible. And I think it's important to have people uh, with this uh, wide experience and knowledge in order to actually have this kind of seminar and look at the situation today and the possible passes forward. Uh, and to start off this seminar, we will start with a five, seven minute introduction by each participant about the current state in each country 
uh, political prisoners, the rule of law, challenges, difficulties, problems. Uh, and we will uh, start with uh, Alexander. No, okay. uh, sorry, we will start with Gili. No. Georgia, Russia, Belarus. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for <laughs> inviting us. Uh, I would like to greet you all. Thank for invitation to the Helmarkton Foundation. It's a great opportunity for us to speak about the problems. Uh, however, uh, I would not be so promising maybe that uh, that uh, the Europe without political prisoners, uh, I mean, the especially the eastern part of Europe, is far from uh, that uh, uh, paradise condition because uh, uh, our countries, unfortunately, us, uh, unfortunately are full of uh, uh, political prisoners. Uh, there are numerous political prosecutions. Uh, and uh, in spite of uh, our hope that uh, at some point this uh, political madness in my country would be stopped. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this uh, is uh, still going on and uh, it's a very good opportunity to address these issues because uh, uh, sometimes we are not enough vocal about this problem. So, how it all started? Uh, uh, we all know that in Georgia in 2012 there was a peaceful transition of power. And uh, this was very unique to uh, my country because this was the uh, first time that uh, through the ballot box country made uh, this uh, uh, very important change and step uh, to future uh, to strengthening the democracy. But unfortunately uh, we uh, faced the uh, opposite move from uh, new government and now the current government. Uh, what are the first signs of uh, uh, political retribution? Uh, the, and this is very iconic word that uh, Mr. Ivanishvili, the current ruler, informal ruler of uh, uh, Georgia, used uh, uh, after, uh, uh, after his victory. He said that uh, now we have to start restoration of justice. These are very, very dangerous words because the country that has never had justice properly functioning judiciary system based on rule of law and due process, this is very dangerous because we have legacy from 90s that uh, we have never had any uh, justice system and we have uh, uh, most of all, the common legacy of Soviet period that we all know there was no judiciary at <laughs> all. <laughs> Formally, it had existed, but really it doesn't. So, the first uh, and all the problems is start with the words. Restoration of justice, this term has replaced the term rule of law. Rule of law has disappeared from our, let's say, lexicon and uh, only the word that has replaced uh, rule of law was restoration of justice. And restoration of justice in uh, Georgian version means, up until now, retribution and politically motivated uh, persecution of political opponents. I'm not naive and I'm not talking that everybody and everything was uh, uh, nice uh, when we were in government. but. Uh, numerous cases and most of all, all the observers, objective observers show, uh, from OSCE and etc. showed that uh, most of the cases were politically motivated and prosecutor as well as judges acted not based on the law but based uh, uh, on the phone order of the uh, Mr. Ivanishvili. Um, one person can be uh, guilty in, where in, in some case, another in some, but when we are talking about entire government, when we are talking about the president, about the prime minister, about the mayor, about uh, six to seven to eight ministers, and one that uh, around 10,000 people were interrogated in one year. This all shows that this was a political process and nothing has to do with the due process and rule of law. 
right now we have uh, uh, several political prisoners, uh, prosecuted president that had had been forced out of the country and now he's, uh, I'm not going into the details about his endeavors in Ukraine, you all follow that. However, we have split it as a party. I have to admit that uh, what we have seen was a politically motivated persecution uh, and uh, I'm very happy that he's not in prison in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, what we have now in Georgia uh, and uh, there is no, uh, no other instance uh, uh, as objective as Human Rights Court in Strasbourg. Former Prime Minister uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Merabishvili had applied and uh, he won uh, and the uh, big chamber of uh, uh, Human Rights Court stated that uh, Article 18 were violated against him. Uh, and what was very amazing, the uh, phrase uh, uh, said by uh, Minister of Justice, and I, I would like to quote it because it's, uh, it's very important. The state considers the case to have been decided in its favor. So, and she said this first time when the sector of the Human Rights Court stated the same. And they said, so we have won. In spite, they have uh, went and uh, applied to the Grand Chamber. So it means that you have won, but still you are applying. And this is a nonsense. How is it possible? If you won, you won. I have to apply, yes. But, uh, but uh, the Grand Chamber stated the same, that the Article 18 were violated. Uh, and the state, uh, um, uh, I mean the official authorities, are the same, uh, uh, same the same. We hope uh, that uh, uh, this political persecution will be stopped because uh, uh, this new government is uh, already more, uh, it, it's, a, it's a five year that they are in, in government, already six, uh, uh, three times they won the different elections. And uh, uh, honestly, we hoped that uh, after the election in 2016, I mean the parliamentary election, uh, Georgia will change its course and uh, step by step will release uh, political prisoners. But unfortunately we have uh, the opposite move. Uh, one month ago another um, uh, political activist of uh, uh, United National Movement Party was arrested. This guy was six years ago the po uh, policeman and the charges no, it is a misuse of his, his own power, but the charges are that uh, uh, the charges, I would say, the uh, uh, numerous cases during these five years were the same, but none of uh, the policemen were prosecuted. And suddenly, uh, uh, the guy who was six to eight years ago prosecutor, uh, so, uh, the policeman, and now he was a lawyer, an activist uh, of the party, and uh, also was the single, single mandate candidate from, from the party in one of the districts, he was arrested. So on the surface we see selectiveness. <laughs> I am not going into the details because I don't want to bother and we have, not, uh, we have time limitation, but on the surface we see that, and the final is that, uh, whether it is, okay, we, we, we say, and my message always is that I'm not going to, uh, to, to, to retribute because, uh, and my party's, uh, my party's, European Georgia's party's official announcement, and this differs uh, as to uh, any other political parties, including my uh, uh, former party. In spite of the fact that we are treated unfairly, we have to, at, the, at some point, we have to stop this because uh, it reflects not only the image of the country, it reflects very on the practical way to the future of the country. Because current administration, where they see that all the, each new uh, government will start its actions to prosecute the its uh, predecessor, it means that the current government will do everything, falsificate, fraud election, and do everything not to give the power. 
Otherwise, because he will believe that he will be persecuted. So the main issue, and this is an issue of stability and development of the country, some people who has responsibility to the future of the country should say, we have to stop this. This is not a justice. This is not a rule of law. And finally, what is, what is important? Um, countries like Georgia and uh, uh, or Ukraine or Russia or Belarus, change the peaceful transition of power is an opportunity. It's a small window of opportunity to prove the uh, efficiency of judiciary and its independence. Because, okay, it might not be free, uh, completely free when we were in government, but this window of opportunity should be used in order to get it more free. And uh, uh, this government, current government, has a clear choice. Either let to the judiciary be free or to use judiciary on its purposes for the retribution. And unfortunately, they took this pass. And now what we are facing is the complete failed judiciary and uh, uh, even uh, uh, European uh, Union representatives who spend millions of euros in improving judiciary are openly saying now that judicial reform in Georgia has completely failed. And failed because the choice was clear and the wrong choice was made. When you use judiciary for political purposes, you have to know that you have to tolerate then when judges start to take bribes. And now what we have, we have had, okay, not free judges, but not corrupted. Now we have corrupted judges, partly, not completely, but they are uh, doing everything. In that case, it's what are the political motivated when the government has, or Ivanishvili has its own um, interest, political interest. Also, when we are talking about the political prisoners, the political prosecutions, judiciary and the free media is another pillar. What happens in Georgia with the free media? I have to admit, when you are watching from the distance, and if you are comparing Georgia with other neighbor countries, of course, <coughs> Georgia is far advanced. And I'm very happy because of that. But from the beginning, Ivanishvili's regime started to, f uh, to prosecute uh, and uh, to fight against uh, the mainstream uh, uh, independent media outlet broadcaster Rustavi II. There was uh, numerous court cases and uh, Ivanishvili's proxies, uh, former, uh, let, uh, former owners, and uh, really they are Ivanishvili's proxies, are suing against them. And up until uh, Supreme Court, this case, uh, the, the, all three instances were galloping. When we have the civil cases, uh, three to ten years lasting and never ending. But in case of Rostavi II, all three stages uh, of uh, uh, appeal were done in one year. And Supreme Court made decision that the Ivanishvili's proxies has to take completely the whole broadcasting company to its uh, under its own. And only, and this was very, very, very big exception. And uh, uh, in, in not only exception, it's, it's a very important pre precedent and we, we never hoped that we, we may succeed that. Uh, Rustavi to apply to the Human Rights Court and the Human Rights Court, very on, on an exceptional base, issued the interim measure that uh, uh, this enforcement should be stopped up until uh, the court will uh, hear uh, uh, the case completely. And this is why it's exception, because uh, such an interim measure is uh, uh, always done as usual, usually done uh, when uh, it's an imminent uh, threat of the life, not about the, um, not about the freedom of speech. And this is very important decision, not only for Georgia, it's very important uh, uh, decision for Ukraine, for, uh, for Russia, for Belarus, because uh, this forceful, uh, not a forceful, but uh, through the judiciary um, takeover of the media outlets, it happens everywhere. Okay. And it has happened uh, in case of uh, uh, NTV.
uh, we all know this case. So this is very important uh, obstacle now, uh, and it, it's it's very important uh, uh, obstacle for for the protection of uh, of the human rights and the freedom of expression. So uh, to summarize, we have the political prisoners, unfortunately, in spite uh, of all these uh, uh, Strasbourg court decisions, uh, we. Uh, uh, because of the, uh, this uh, politically motivated prosecution, uh, we have damaged uh, the reputation uh, and damaged the judiciary. And unfortunately, we have damaged the reputation of the country because only thing that uh, we, uh, w w what are issues about the Georgia when you listen. Okay, Georgia is far away with, in compare with Belarus, with Russia. This is very nice, and we have endorsed this, and we have participated in enhancing that. But another issue is the political prisoners. Yes, Nothing good news comes from our country, which which uh, which is very very bad. But uh, unfortunately, it's a, it is a reality. So uh, thank you. I am running out of the time, so I li leave my colleagues to continue. And of course, I'm open for further questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you. And we will, of course, get back to Georgia after the first round. Uh, Alexander, please. Yes, um, my name is Alexander Solovyov, and I'm uh, chairman of the Open Russian Movement within Russia. So I was, uh, I was willing to uh, stress out a few moments about Russian protests, which happened uh, in uh, March 26th and then in June 12th, and the current situation. So let's start with the with this March. Uh, largest on sanctions demonstrations uh, so uh, they took place uh, because Alexei Navalny uh, uh, called people to go to uh, to street and to show their attitude to those uh, corruption cases uh, so um, um, well first of all um, I should mention uh, the fact that when we call that uh, that action as uh, unsanctioned <coughs> protests, you will hear that for sure from pro-Putin uh, officials that those uh, protests were unsanctioned. I should explain uh, a few words about Russian legislation on protests. Actually, we have um, at Article 31 in our Constitution, which says that uh, w which guarantees citizens uh, the right to freedom, the right uh, to assembly in a free way. So it just says that people has a right to uh, assemble and to meet with, uh, without weapons and uh, in a peaceful way. This is it. That means that people can. But actually, uh, uh, there are a few federal, ro federal laws which are supposed to be a uh, complement to the Constitution uh, without violati violating uh, rights which is uh, in the Constitution. But uh, however, uh, while well the existing law uh, in Russia is um, uh, well concerning demonstrations uh, this on this uh, small topic, uh, it imposes a lot of limitations. And in fact, it violates the uh, constitutional uh, right to uh, gather uh, peacefully. So, um, uh, well, these um, limitations has been disputed a lot of times in constitutional court but guess who is running constitutional court in russia well you you can you can guess i think and um, so uh for example in moscow uh, authorities uh i'm serious right now this is not a joke authorities usually announce that kind of a cookie festival uh will take place on all central public places literally all public places and then they demand that opposition groups go together somewhere in a suburb uh, and uh, there's no cookie uh, and and of course there is no cookie i mean from time to time it happens that they hold some kind of a festival but uh, in regions uh, they usually say that this uh, site is going to be occupied by a kind of a you know pro putin uh, meeting and we usually have uh, volunteers who are monitoring this site and there is zero people usually, really nobody. Uh, so this is, this is how they do that. And they, uh, we also have this uh, um, guide parks, high parks, 
which means that every single city and the administration of this city is creating this Hyde Park, uh, whatever they want. Actually, they used to be uh, in the center of the city. It's a small, you know, square or something like that where everybody can hold a meeting without any uh, appealing to the to the administrative to the administration. So you just go there and you just hold a, a meeting, and this is it. But still, they uh, spoiled this idea. Uh, and uh, well, first of all, they place those Hyde Parks, whatever they want. And my favorite uh, Hyde Park is located in the city of Tambov. Uh, so the only place where citizens are allowed to hold demonstration is the local graveyard. Uh, this is also, I'm serious, absolutely serious. So uh, the local opposition uh, activists uh, even held a couple of, of uh, meetings there just to show the stupidity of the situation because th this is the only way to, to meet. I mean, the, grave the graveyard, oh, well, okay, let's meet there. So whenever when someone pro-Putin uh, say uh, that those meetings were unsanctioned, you just uh, bear in mind this uh, legislation. Um, uh, still, people sometimes go to street, although uh, it is, I mean, there are few of them, not, not, not that much as in March and in June. So um, uh, in my opinion, the government itself did everything to make those, well, you know, to those uh, meetings look violent because they ordered the police to show no mercy to the protesters. Uh, because uh, it looks like, you know, protesters just staying in one place and the police officers is announcing that your uh, action is not uh, sanctioned, please go away. People are just wondering, and some of the people really do not understand what's going on because they, were, they are not in a meeting. They, were, they are just ordinary citizens. And they're like, you know, watching on the police officers and then police officers just say, well, beat these guys. And uh, a bunch of people is being beaten uh, in, a, in a very severe way. And uh, well, probably in order to discourage people of uh, taking part in, in this uh, protest. So um, as a result of the 26th of March, a large group of uh, investigators, almost 145 investigators, was formed to pursue criminal charges because most of the uh, <coughs> activists are usually uh, charged with administrative, uh, they, they usually have administrative charges, but from time to time they uh, try to make new criminal cases. So. Now we have 12 new names uh, that, had be, that has been added to the list of uh, political prisoners. And uh, five of these people are uh, being represented by Open Russia. So two of them has already been convi convicted and uh, three others who have, uh, well, they are awaiting uh, a court hearing. So um, I would like the international community to uh, to remember those 12 people and remind Russian authorities uh, them ev on every available occasion because these people are not protest leaders. This is very important to understand. Uh, they are not famous activists. Uh, for instance, the five of, the, of them which whom we are representing <coughs> as Alexander Shpakov, a carpenter, uh, who went to the demonstration with his daughter in order to protect her in some case. And he did, and that's why he's being uh, accused of, uh, uh, you know, of um, mm, demonstrating some violence toward a police officer. I will say a couple of words a little bit later about this violence. So uh, Rasim Iskakov, a homeless man from Dagestan. Uh, so and um, Alexei Politikov, a father of three children and a uh, shipping agent from uh, Far East. Um, and um, he was sentenced a, a year and a half, uh, two years to be precise, then we managed to make it a year and a half for hugging a policeman. Uh, I mean, I'm serious, this is written in a, in a criminal case, I mean, as a, in a decision of the court. So you hug a policeman, that means you showed some violence to him. And um, Mikhail Galyashkin, an 18 years old schoolboy, he's now uh, under house arrest and he's allowed only to visit his English lessons. And a history student from Volgograd. So uh, most of those people came to streets for the first time. Uh, and as, the, as well as the majority of, of the rest of the people. So uh, because these people are now doing it because um, they 
well, most of these people are young people, but not not. Uh, it's not like you know, eighty percent or seventy percent. It's just uh, young people who are uh, fed up with a, with this one and the same situation because they've been living uh, uh, in Putin regime for the whole their lives. I mean, they now even have a right to vote, but they haven't seen anyone except Putin in power. So uh, uh, even if they are not against Putin, they understand that, well, that looks not normal. Uh, for the whole of our life, we have nobody except Putin. And that's why uh, they pose a threat to Putin's regime, especially uh, on the eve of uh, his elections. I'm, I, I know I'm running out of time. Uh, so just a couple of words more. So uh, just a couple of words about statistics. So uh, in two, 26th of March, over 1,000 people were detained. So for the last time, we had this situation in 1993. Uh, so uh, we didn't have the situation even uh, during the Balotna protests in 2012. Uh, on the June of 12th, even uh, only in St. Petersburg, there were more than 500 detained people. And uh, <coughs> for the past three months, we managed to help uh, 800 for more than 800 activists. Uh, almost, uh, well, help uh, having the help of our law lawyers, almost 400 of uh, those people were able to leave police stations without any consequences. Not because uh, this is the only, uh, this was done just by our lawyers, but in some cases you may use the situation when you see that police officers do not want to have any bureaucratic problems with these uh, people and they may let them go. It, it happens from time to time. Uh, and uh, the most more important thing is that we didn't leave these people uh, alone. I mean, uh, because people do not know what to do in police station. They usually believe that if police officers say them to do something, they think that this is legal. But in most cases, in 90% cases, police officers ask them to do uh, some illegal things. They, they do not know the law, actually, to be precise. So this is the problem of, uh, of Russian uh, uh, pressure on activists. And uh, as long as I've already run out of time, uh, when we discuss some questions, I would like to specifically stress out uh, the current situation uh, because uh, the pressure has become more sophisticated. Uh, and, um, uh, and the current situation on open Russia, if it's, if it's interesting, because we've been uh, now, are, they are trying to say that we're a banned organization, undesirable organization. And they're, well, let's, well, let's finish that. I will, I will add a couple of words later, but sorry. Thank you very much. And of thank course, you. we will get back to that. Uh, please, Andrei. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for coming here. Um, I will start from uh, the situation in Belarus. And I think the main change today, we see how regime is learning, how to keep pressure on civil society, political mm -hmm. opposition, and stay away from the sanctions of EU using EU regulations, using EU manner of reactions. And I think that's a challenge both for political uh, opposition and civil society in Belarus, but both for EU countries. But, let's, uh, but first, let me say about situation for last year. Uh, I have something good to say, something bad to say. Overall, in March, in spring, we have a quite big protest and it was the biggest protest thing for the, since 2010, but it was mostly social protest against the decree, so, uh, so-called decree about uh, social parasites. You know, they invent the law according to this, if you lose a job, you have to pay to the government. I mean, this nice measure, but unfortunately people didn't take it right, properly as they would like to take this. And uh, coming back to what our, my Russian colleague said, like cookies happen, yes, and uh, so they find that uh, People come to the street, express their views, and where it were thousands of people in every cities, and then we, s we saw the reaction. And uh, what was we see? We see how they detain people for a very short time of period, then release him, and you cannot react on this. Or they uh, keep giving to people who come to peacefully protest so huge fines, they can to pay off. And you cannot react on it because it's not a clearly political persecution, you know. You just get, you know, $2,000 fine, $2, fine when you earn, for example, 150 per month. And of course, you will never appear on the street anymore because how, I mean, how you will pay this off. So 
that's what that's what is going on to, going on today in Belarus. So what we have, we have two political prisoners recognized by human rights watch organizations, and one of his leader of uh, critical mass is a bicycle organization. They do some bicycle things, and another one, uh, he uh, was an activist of uh, human rights organization trying to deal with violation of uh, law in, uh, in in jails, and now he's jailed himself. Uh, as well, uh, for last year, we have 1,267 fact of detaining people, and, uh, but not of them were sentenced. So they were detained, for example, for a day, and then released. According to our law, it's possible. And 200 were, uh, got sentenced uh, from uh, 5 to 25 days in jail. And that's how they do things, you know. Uh, as well, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, big fines to people who is peacefully protesting against some measures of some doing against the government. But I want to mention as well the huge fines to journalists who is doing their job in Belarus uh, of uh, mostly uh, representing uh, independent TV channel Belsat, and there are kind of the basement for this. The base for this that is this uh, channel doesn't have. Uh, license to work in Belarus. And then it's a tricky point because, you know, they didn't give to, to this channel license to work and then they punished journalists to do their job. And uh, as well, uh, I would say that uh, they're trying to work with people who are joining organizations. So they're trying to, you know, have, if, if you're students, you will have special talks, you know, with you on your place where you're study. If you're uh, if you have your job, you will have special talk when, when you at, at your job place, where they say, hey, you should understand, why do you do need this, you know, it's better don't join them, better stay away from this, it's politics, don't you think, and things like this. Uh, this is about negative side. So this is, they try to keep pressure, they try to uh, hold their hand on, let's say, uh, hand of, uh, of, of society. But at the same time, I, it would not, would not be honest to say about some positive things. And uh, uh, first of all, I mentioned, tell the truth, uh, organization I represent got registration, and we were fighting for this for seven years. We got it this year as well, as well uh, but still there are many organizations, political one, who cannot get registration, you know, for many years, other political parties, political organizations, for example, human rights watch organizations, uh, VESNA, couldn't do this for 10, more than 10 years, and we still have in our criminal codex an article according to which you can go to be, you can go, go to jail up for two years if you represent unregistered organization, and they still not banned it. Uh, as well as positive, I would say they stopped now criminal case against White Legion, this political organization. It was totally fake criminal case against activists, but now they stop it finally, and we are like really happy of that. Uh, as well, we see that they as we establish human rights dialogue between Belarus and EU with a participation of civil society representatives, and the, I would say development dialogue within the within the Belarus. That's what we could mention as positive changes or like positive steps about human rights they, they mention as be in, in Belarus. Uh, but uh, what we should do about this? I would I would stress maybe five points that I would think could help us to move right direction. Uh, first is of course keeping human rights agenda on international level. Human rights agenda should be not separate, but part of any kind of dialogue. I mean, about economic support, about uh, faci visa facilitation, all of this. Second, I would say, is to, to understand that human uh, rights, it's not only about political rights. It's about any other rights you we see today. For example, in Belarus today, it's very important labor right, because we have economic crisis, and we found ourselves that if you lose your job, you have no rights at all, even more government wants you to pay for this, you know. And that's very important of us. If you want to get support of society, we need to show them that human rights is not about this minority who is fighting with government, but about everyone. The third one is make the agenda clear. I think sometimes when we talk about human rights, it's so broadly, it's so... We want you just to improve the broad situation, the atmosphere. But I think it should be more specific about the country. These, uh, this organization has to be registered. These people has to be released. 
So to, to have it, this journalist cannot be punished for doing their job by fines, anyhow you will, basement. So it should be more clear agenda what we want to get and what we want to achieve when we talk about human rights. And of course, we need to develop a Belarus EU or a Belarus EU uh, dialogue about human rights. And as Belarus today is more willing to talk about this, I think we need to try and to think how to fulfill uh, this dialogue by real measures that could <coughs> move forward our country on human rights dimension. As and I said, we need to find a way how to react in a positive way, but still how to react about this new approach of the government uh, that g give them possibility to keep uh, pressure on civil society and political opponents, but still not get punished, unless I not, not get any reaction from EU countries and EU as such. Thank you very much. I think I was a good time. Yeah. Yes, you were. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, is it possible, uh, Alexander, if you could uh, just elaborate a little bit about the, the laws in Russia when it comes to undesirable organizations, and in particular in the case of Open Russia? Sure. Um, uh, actually, uh, they invented the law about undesirable organizations in 2015, and the law is written, as they do like it, in a very uncertain way. Uh, that happens usually due to two uh, reasons. Uh, uh, first of all, sometimes they're just not professionals. I mean, they're a bit stupid even. Uh, the, uh, some of them cannot write draft laws because they, are, they have a mission to write this draft law and uh, they cannot understand how can we make this law just to look at it, at least legal. That's why it looks very, very unprofessional or just, you know, like uh, even, even stupid. From the other hand, they... S they uh, intentionally from time to time make it uh, not certain just to make it possible to use for every organization. So this uh, law says that uh, any uh, international or foreign organization, non-government organization, can be uh, uh, named uh, non-desirable, but actually this word doesn't mean that it is undesirable. It, is, it, it means that it is banned. And as long as it continues the action in the Russian Federation, uh, the uh, ordinary participants will get two fines, quite big fines. And then if they continue working with this organization, they are going to jail up to six years. So uh, they have this specific article, which was also in criminal court, which was, al was also created in 2015. It is 284.1, to be precise, yes. And um, so nowadays, they really use this law against, um, for instance, Open Russia civic movement. And the thing is that they are prohibiting, oh, they are uh, breaking even their own uh, law because uh, Open Russia civic movement is a Russian movement. Uh, Open Russia website and all the different websites they are blocking right now are Russian websites and we have all the documents about that uh, but still they are just uh, paying no attention to that of course we'll go to court but the court is a tricky thing in Russia for instance a couple of years ago they were usually trying to do well at least uh, uh, um, uh, well at least they were playing a role that uh, well okay you uh, came to court now uh, you say your things we're gonna say our things and we'll we'll make the decision so we would always provide uh, the 100 uh, percent evidences and the judge would always say there is i have no reason not to trust the official information of the police officers or, or of the general prosecutor you keep saying that but wait a minute there is another evidence and she just or he, he just they would always keep saying i have no reason not to trust you, you know that, that what it looked like a couple of years ago nowadays what do they do they don't even take the case to court they say you cannot appeal to the court with this case you say wait a minute how does that happen you go to appeal to the higher court and the higher court also says well that's correct you cannot appeal with this to the court so th you don't have any access even to those spoiled uh, justice, which is not justice. It's, it has never been a justice. And uh, so uh, general prosecutor has uh, violated even Russian law uh, by saying that open Russia movement 
uh, is an international movement or a foreign movement and uh, is an undesirable organization. And by blocking the, all the websites. By the way, uh, uh, yesterday uh, they said that they are going to block Twitter if Twitter does not block our account on Twitter. They are going to block the whole Twitter on the whole the territory of Russian Federation. Twitter said that actually guys well you're prohibiting even your laws so what what do you demand from us we're not gonna d block this account today they said that they're going to block the whole YouTube on the whole territory of Russian Federation if they do not block our account on YouTube so I do not understand what's going on because this is too stupid even for them uh, really because they they know that they have no tools and have no means to uh, to block uh, hundred percent block Twitter or, or YouTube in Russia. Probably they do not know how internet works, uh, and we have more and more evidences. So that's how they do use this law about undesirable organization. And unfortunately, they are making more and more fines right now. For instance, in during the Moscow conference, uh, federal conference of the movement, they uh, uh, actually asked. They detained 105 uh, five people, I think. Yes, all of those were delegates from different regions. And they demanded them to uh, write down the explanation. What were they doing in, uh, in this building and why did they come to this conference? And of course, we were advising people. We had uh, lawyers. We knew that they would come. So we had lawyers. We had uh, positions, official positions. But still, uh, they are. I'm afraid they are about to to uh, make new 100 fines, and they have uh, they have already fined a couple of people in regions. If they do have two fines, well, it's it becomes too dangerous because the next one is going to be a criminal criminal case and uh, a possibility to go to prison. Unfortunately, that's how they do behave right now in in Russia. Thank you. Uh, Gigi, you mentioned that the European Georgia has to be a part of <coughs> working to improve the situation in the country. Uh, how, are, uh, how is your party doing that? Uh, and uh, specifically, do you have an input of the European Union or the Council of Europe? Or <coughs> well, um, when we're talking about uh, future, uh, uh, European future without political prisoners, it's a, uh, it's a important question and uh, I would like to somehow to address how might it be possible. Um, and uh, when we are talking about Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova, we all agree <laughs> that these three countries has a uh, uh, unique positioning uh, within the neighborhood policy because w we, we are well uh, advanced when we compare to Azerbaijan or Belarus uh, or Armenia and etc. So, uh, but still, uh, what do we need uh, uh, in that regard? And uh, this is a very important question. We, uh, these three countries got uh, association agreement. These three countries got uh, uh, DCFTA, uh, the free trade agreement. And these three countries were granted of uh, visa-free regime. These are the biggest achievement uh, uh, for our countries. Uh, but now we need another benchmark uh, in order to draw our path toward the more integration into the European Union. I understand all the obstacles that uh, might be occur on that uh, uh, way, but uh, I am uh, going back to, to this issue that is, uh, uh, and this is a very uh, relevant point. When we are talking about the future cooperation with uh, European Union, uh, we need, as I told you, uh, uh, benchmark. It should not be banned with the time. I understand all these problems. But this has to be imply another uh, uh, top priorities and issues that from one side will keep Georgia on the right track and uh, to the European Union gives uh, uh, the means and tools for scrutinize the deliverables. And uh, why it's important? This all stuff, I mean, uh, for example, let's take the uh, issue of uh, visa liberalization. There was a numerous things that Georgia has fulfilled and we, will we were granted this. 
And these are technical things. Now, the next step for Georgia, for Ukraine and Moldova has to be the new challenges. Rule of law, respect of the political rights, respect of minorities, and the country should not have political prisoners and politically prosecutors people, prosecuted peoples. What we have right now, we have the cases, well, if it's a well-known person, uh, some uh, person or some institution from European Union may say, we are observing this case, we are closely watching this case, uh, it's internal uh, uh, issue of this particular country, but, and it's all. We need the permanent scrutiny on this particular stuff. And this should be part of the European integration path of Georgia, of Ukraine and uh, Moldova as an A-plus countries. What else should be uh, uh, another benchmark? Because uh, uh, right now we, we have got everything what we needed and the European Union gave everything what might at this stage gave to these countries. But if there won't, won't be any other further benchmark, then, then, uh, then it will be uh, very, very difficult to shape, uh, to keep in a good shape our government. And sometimes you, you even can't imagine how uh, um, solid and strong uh, soft power you have in order to improve human rights situation in these countries. And you have to use that. That's, uh, and this should be part of the European uh, po uh, Union's policy toward uh, Georgia, which is not, unfortunately, right now. We, uh, we, we, we are getting huge assistance um, in order to improve ju free judiciary, but this is not consistent, this is not a part of this bigger picture. So, th and this is the problem, so that's why I think the next benchmark uh, for the accession or the uh, further integration of Georgia to the European Union should imply as much as possible human rights issues. Because we have the huge problem of this type, prisoners. We have the huge problem of the protection of the minorities, especially the sexual minorities, and it's a religious minorities, and etc. And unfortunately, this type of uh, uh, things were felt by Russia, uh, because these are the things uh, which uh, Russia's propaganda is using against the Europe, presenting Europe as a bunch of uh, gays and etc. etc. And this propaganda unfortunately works. So this is not an issue only of the political prisoners. It's an issue of the continued um, policy, human rights policy that should be part and uh, very. And uh, the, um, the sign that it's uh, seriously taken, it's not uh, when the high official will say something. No, when the lowest bureaucrat will, uh, uh, on the routine based, uh, will, uh, is assessing these problems and gives uh, uh, to, to, to Brussels or to, uh, to the high officials uh, the assessment that something wrong goes on in that direction. And political prisoners, unfortunately, is one of these, uh, um, no, it's on the top and it's, it's a visible. There are many other, these type of problems. And uh, I think, uh, uh, I think we, we have to, to work on particularly on that direction when we are talking about the further <laughs> aspiration and further uh, closer move to, to, to European Union. And this is, I think, <coughs> applicable to these three countries right now. Uh, and my colleagues will not uh, get upset, but, but uh, in that regard, there are uh, huge differences between uh, Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine uh, versus uh, um, uh, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia and, and uh, Belarus. We have different types of problems. Uh, when it comes to, uh, for example, the, for instance, the European Court of Human Rights, we know in the case of Russia <coughs> that the country is held to be in violation uh, of the convention by the court in many decisions. Uh, but what kind of role does uh, uh, the court play in Russia when it comes to institutions or for that matter Council of Europe? And then afterwards for you, Andre, what kind of uh, influence and importance does international uh, <coughs> institutions play uh, in the sense of uh, um, strengthening up the situation or improving it? 
Uh, well, talking about European court, um, so, well, first of all, I should mention the fact that uh, in Russian Federation, uh, <coughs> a year ago, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a new kind of a law, again, was invented. Yes, Putin is obsessed with the law and making everything loyal. I, 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 the imitation is his favorite word. He imitates everything, democracy, elections, etc., etc., uh, independent courts. Uh, so uh, uh, a new law has been passed, uh, and it says that uh, when it comes to decide whether it's obligatory or not to implement the decision of European court, it is about it's up to us to decide is it uh, <coughs> obligatory or not. So, uh, but at the same time, we're not withdrawing from uh, from from this from this topic, you know. So uh, this is uh, again this uncertainty. They like to. I mean, the Kremlin likes to this uncertainty. We're not waging a war. It's just not a. It's not a war, you know. It's a, It's uh, all those rebels. So it's uncertain uh, situation. So uh, the same situation with this with this law, and uh, of course a lot of uh, detained people appeal to European <coughs> court, and uh, those who were detained and spent uh, a night in the police station. And those who do not deny the fact that they were using their constitutional right to be in the street together peacefully, uh, those people uh, very quickly uh, take positive decision from the European Court and very quickly are being uh, paid the compensation. Uh, but the rest of the cases are usually stuck in the European Court for six, seven, eight years. That's why uh, this is almost impossible to appear to appeal to this court in different cases. And there is also another problem. They say that there is a Russian lobby in the European court who are responsible for declining the uh, appeals uh, due to the uh, technical uh, things, you know, to some uh, mistakes in, uh, um, in the appeals or something like that, not due to the political things. And uh, they usually find them, a lot of them. So uh, I do not know whether it's truth or not, but still the percentage of the cases which are not being even uh, considered because uh, there were some mistakes is huge. Uh, so uh, actually European court is still useful for a lot of uh, activists whose rights has been violated by Russian officials. Uh, but unfortunately there is a very small kind of uh, cases uh, which are being solved fast. Uh, the rest of them has been usually, uh, they are usually stuck in this court for many, many years. Uh, and uh, well, you cannot s from time to time do anything else. You just sit and wait before your, uh, this, uh, well, before your case has been uh, listened uh, because this is too dangerous for you to continue the uh, the any any actions in in Russia because uh, if uh, the court denies your uh, case, uh, Russia has got a lot of laws that say that if uh, the decision is in power, uh, the next decision will mean <coughs> that uh, you're you go to prison. That's why sometimes it's it means that if you go to European court, this is it. You're sitting and waiting till it decides at least something. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Carmen, uh, talking about international organization, I think um, we shouldn't, of course, always estimate uh, the influence. And we saw it through the last uh, 20 years that uh, uh, once government feel more or less uh, free, they are very, how to say, easy to stop any kind of international organization, you know, work in Belarus if they don't like it. But at the same time, I wouldn't uh, uh, underestimate it because we see that when they need and actually when they feel the real, how to say, profit from the cooperation, they're trying to find a way how to cooperate. They're trying to find a way how to fit criteria. Even sometimes they try to pick ones they like and, uh, you know, keep far from uh, ones they don't like. So I would mention few which I think more or less successful in Belarus in, this, if in these terms. First, of course, a uni UNDP program, United Nations program. I think they do a lot of programs, and they actually do a lot of about human right dimension, uh, about children and women and things like this. 
And I think uh, they find a way how to talk to our government. They find a way how to cooperate. We sometimes criticize them for about being too hidden from the public, you know, being too hidden from the civil society observation, what they're doing, how they spend this money. But still, we, uh, we, we could say that, yes, they do things. As well, of course, for, uh, for last time, we have a quite good dialogue between with OC mission. And even our uh, government uh, haven't adopted the law changes to electoral codex. We had uh, OC uh, assembly in uh, Minsk this summer, and we see that government is ready to talk to them and ready to listen to them. Maybe sometimes it's not about changing the law, but about changing of implementation of the law, which is quite important still. As well, I would say about that, of course, the uh, increase of uh, uh, how to say, influence of financial organizations that are, uh, as well, sometimes could promote uh, things we need to develop to Belarus through the dimension of economy. Because, for example, now when we talk about developing small and medium business, we're talking about access to the justice system. You know, we're talking about the rules of law for them because uh, when we talk about investments, we talk about rules of law. And we say that today the, we have a lack of investment because we don't have or we you know, have problems with the rule of law in Belarus. And that's the way as well sometimes how you can indirectly to talk about things that have positive political effect when we talk about things. Uh, as well, uh, I would say, I would say the, the, the overall, I, I, I would say that our approach is that a more dialogue with uh, Europe, Belarus has on a, from a different uh, perspective, from an, on a different levels, on a different dimensions, the more influence we have, our EU has on situation and can react and can talk in, in, in time, you know. So that's why today we are very in favor, you know, on developing dialogue, you know, whatever we talk about, business, trade unions, you know, human rights dimension, because uh, we, we see what we saw and what we've learned from the last 20 years, that isolation of, 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 of our country unfortunately lead to the uh, limitations of our possibilities as democratic opposition, as civil society, to work with society within the country. And uh, it's, it's clear, I would say it's clear things depending on each other. More dialogue with Europe, we have more possibilities to us to act in Belarus and work with people reaching out them, which is our goal. Less dialogue, more isolation, less possibilities within the country. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, then I would just like, before the questions, to take one final round, if you have something to uh, end up with or pass on to the audience. Just uh, two minutes. I think it's better to yeah. go to questions. Okay, yeah. fine. Answer the question. Uh, Simply talking, no. Yes, uh, and please uh, introduce yourself and uh, where you're from. <laughs> no more than ten. <laughs> um, and we'll leave. First of all, I'm um, I'm interested in um, the number of electoral tribunals in, in Georgia. Oh, sorry. Um, in Georgia, compared to Russia, for example, compared to Belarus. Um, and having said that, I mean it, it quickly becomes very technical. I know uh, I tried to follow Memorial, mm -hmm. the number of political prisoners that they yeah. um, recognize, and. At some point, I mean, I, I suddenly realized, well, even if I say, well, they have recognized 84 political prisoners by now, people will say, well, that's not so much in a country of 144 million. So it quickly gets very technical. And, and how do you keep attention to the individual fate of <coughs> political prisoners? Um, I mean, I'm fascinated by how we've all forgotten about Sensor, for example. Um, although it was a very big thing when he was convicted. Um, and also, I'm, I'm interested in um, whether you have suggestions on how do we talk about this when they're not actually political prisoners, but rather, I, I think you said, we, we, should, um, we should focus on not just human rights, but, uh, or political rights, but human rights. Um, I mean, if, if, for example, it becomes impossible to actually exercise your pro profession, profession. Uh, you're not a political prisoner, but you have in fact um, 
lost perhaps what is most important to you in life. Um, and then also, do you know if there's a, a, a good study, this is specifically on Russia, if there's a good study or something written on how, um, how the authorities are trying to influence young people in universities and in, in schools. Um, I know that they have political lectures that uh, Rothenberg and other have been mm -hmm. uh, uh, holding. And just one thing also on, I think it's very wise what you said, that you weren't going to demand retribution. Um, uh, I think this is definitely the way forward. But having said that, it, are there crimes that you would have to um, prosecute anyway? Uh -huh. uh, and also it has to do with property. Do you leave property, property? Do you leave property in the hands of people who've actually managed to um, get a, gain a hold uh -huh. of it through political uh, power? Um, yeah, so lots of questions. <laughs> lots of questions, yeah. So, to start? Uh, probably we should start, well, from the very first question. So, you've asked how many political prisoners there are in Russia. To be precise, I um, almost agree with the numbers that uh, Memorial uh, pr uh, pronounced, uh, but I think there are more, something like, well, not, not twice more, but something like 120 probably, because it's sometimes even hard to find all the uh, cases. Uh, and if we say uh, about the, uh, you know, this are the, um, uh, this is the number about the, those cases about the politically active people. But there are a lot of people who has been sentenced uh, because they are not politically active and we cannot know about this anything. And there are a lot of them. We cannot name them in the full meaning of this word, political prisoners, but these sentences were absolutely illegal and they are thousands for sure. You can be sure because we have this stupid system, the so-called uh, stick systems. Uh, it means that you've got, uh, you've got to, to have not less than, for instance, 10 cases a month, police officer is being said that you have to make those 10 cases on this article, 10 cases on this article, and five cases on this. Even if they don't exist in your region, you should create them. So this is how they do that. They create them, really. For instance, uh, it was a wave of anti-pedophilia uh, in Russia, and they had to find pedophiles everywhere. So I know one case when a girl was writing, was uh, uh, drawing um, uh, uh, a picture in uh, kindergarten. And uh, uh, an expert said that I see that the, t the tail of the cat symbolizes uh, uh, actually a man's, uh, well, organs. And that means that her father rapes her. And this is it. That was enough to put him into prison for eight years or something like that. So um, uh, the same situation, I, I know one situation that happened with, a, with one boy. He is now something like 13 or 14 years old. He appeals every single day that nobody raped him. He says that he knows a lot of laws already. He's a good lawyer already. But he says that nobody raped me. Stop doing this stupidity. I mean, this is Kafka or something like that. But still, people are in prison, and we do not know the exact figure of them. The system puts people into prison just to make it, you know, to make it, to make the statistics looks good. Uh, how can you say how many political prisoners in such a system? You cannot. You may easily say that a half, because well, half of them has been made just according to this, just to fulfill the statistics. So. Uh, how can we um, uh, maintain uh, the, how can we keep the um, attention to those cases? Well, the only thing is to unite our, our efforts. For instance, we cooperate with Memorial, we cooperate with uh, Ovodinfo, we cooperate with different organizations, and uh, we help those families. And those families usually say that, listen, do not forget about us. These organizations are helping us and we still are living without dad or without husband. And this is it. But uh, unfortunately, the, the numbers are that high that, yes, we, I accept the fact that people are uh, tired of all those cases. They, uh, they take it for granted. When they hear something about new political prisoner, 
Well, we've got a lot of them. Then when they hear about another politician who's uh, taking bribes and he's the closest Putin friend, well, we got used to that. So, you know, the only thing, uh, journalists usually say that in an open way for me. And I say, we've got another topic. Listen, please write about that. They say, well, uh, I, we hope at least somebody is killed there. And I know that it's not, nobody is killed there. Well, then it's not interesting. I mean, so the, the level is, well, is enormous of hatred. That's how, well, but still we, we do what, what we can. So, uh, first uh, about the number. Uh, uh, it, it varies, that's why it's very difficult and uh, I don't have the uh, report here and I don't want to mislead you, but uh, uh, after the change of the government, uh, uh, nearly half of the government, almost more than half of the government were uh, prosecuted, including president, prime minister, not only the uh, uh, so-called Siloviki, I mean the law enforcement ministers, but uh, 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 other ones, uh, we didn't have anything to do with uh, uh, misuse of power in uh, prisons or uh, or in police forces and etc. Uh, uh, but when we are talking about that, that uh, okay, as I told you, one, two, three person might be guilty in something. But when you have the policy that your predecessor is, that they all are bench of the bandits and they should be prosecuted. And uh, when you deliberately said that I have to organize the Nuremberg process, and when these people are, including president or prime minister, are respected here, are received here, are welcomed here, so uh, you, 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 uh, you have to, as a government, you have to feel that your own feelings, your own hate, your own feelings of revenge is a different thing and uh, reality is a different thing. Uh, they got this message in one, two, three years. They got this message and they find out that there is no 18 billion USD was stolen because Georgian economy can't produce 18 billion as such. There is no, the size of economy can't. They, they, this knowledge comes step by step, but they can't reverse it. They can't say, okay, this was a stupid thing that what I have done. And that now come back to, to your uh, second uh, question, what we have gonna do? Of course, if there is a murderous case or torture or something, it has to be investigated because it's your obligation. But this is a matter of uh, reasonable. What is reasonable to do? You had very uh, li uh, limited, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, professional prosecutor's office, and you have uh, morally and... Uh, uh, morally damaged judiciary. You have to operate with judges, dead judges. You can't bring judges from the heaven. We have an idea to bring the judges uh, from overseas from for the Supreme Court in order to establish the best practices because those people won't have any relatives or any connection to the local politicians and they can establish the true uh, uh, through judgment, but this will be on very limited cases. This is one of the option what we are regarding for future, uh, because everybody understand that if you bring uh, uh, judges, for example, from UK, you can't influence uh, on these judges like you can influence with the local ones. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is uh, 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 the issue of. Uh, what is reasonable for your country? Either prosecute former president uh, because his administration bought uh, several jackets or bought the gift for somebody, even this gift is done by a painter who painted it with her own breast. You can uh, morally uh, and politically damage such things and say that you are not a moral 
president because uh, your country is suffering, people live in poorness, and you are, uh, uh, you, you, you are buying the gift for somebody. But it, regardless, it might be handwritten, hand-painted, or by breast. It doesn't matter. It's a gift, and by law, president administration can buy this. But such things, such stupid things, should not be. Okay, this might be not, uh, not much to the best standards, but this should not be prosecuted. Another thing, for example, also against the president. He pardoned uh, some uh, law enforcement agencies uh, of uh, be uh, the part of oh, some criminal case. He pardoned that. And now he is prosecuting why you have pardoned. This is misuse of power. You never find the country when president's uh, ability and the right, constitutional right to pardon somebody is restricted. This is unilateral. President can pardon even the pedophile, but it will morally damage him, politically will damage him, but not legally because the, to pardon somebody is absolutely unrestricted power uh, of the president by our constitution, and this is the same in all countries. And numerous cases we can find about that. So that's why, what was the charges against me? Against me were the charges that I employed in one of the state services party activists. The prosecutor brought people saying that we were party activists. I, as an evidence, I brought the people to the court that say, saying, yes, I, am, uh, I was a UNM activist, but I was working in this service. It's a garbage collection service. So, okay, it is not the best practice. But what we, are, what we see right now, the same things in a 10 times much, in a much more scale. So, it, minimum, it is a selectiveness. Maximum is uh, it's it's that uh, it's a it's a bad practice in uh, in our countries like sites, uh, countries like Georgia or uh, any other countries because we we are uh, the countries of one party dominated pa uh, countries and uh, the the slogan that the ruling party is a state and the state is a ruling party still unfortunately exists. Sometimes people don't, don't make any distinction between, distinction between ruling party and the state institutions. And it used to be, and unfortunately it is so. And the biggest problem of this statement is that if the state and ruling party are the same, all kind of opposition is an enemy. That's why we have the system. One party dominated system means, and Georgia unfortunately is still the one party dominated system, in spite of the fact that we have um, a change of power and change transition of power, but still one party dominates and all the rest are participating. Then it might be versus one pa another party comes and it's dominate and it's very easy to prove. In all, uh, so since the independence, since we have the self-government, who is in the central government? I the same parties in all self-governments. It means there is no proper cohabitation between the central and the local powers. And the local power is just a uh, prolongation of the central power. So this, uh, that's why such stupid cases, and back to the, the issue and I will finish, uh, such things of course should not be prosecuted. It might be politically, you might be politically attacked. You ma might be politically attacked, but not not prosecuted. Otherwise, with uh, the level of our prosecutors, with the level of our judges, you will go in the same trap. And it, this will be never in this story. And people will like it for two, three months. It's, it's a good thing when they see some people, well, some strong men are under jail. This is the, the, best, uh, uh, the, 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 the best fiction that you can, uh, can uh, uh, see, uh, see. But this is the biggest obstacle for development of the country. So that's why we say we have to stop this in order to move forward. Thank you. Uh, do you have a comment about yes. Belarus, perhaps? Andrew? I would say if we talk about clearly political yes. uh, prisoners uh, that uh, I take uh, on two because uh, that's uh, what human rights organizations saying to us and I fully trust on this issue to them. 
uh, as well, I would say that uh, I want to back this the back that today EU uh, and EU policy could react only on the cases when it's open criminal case, people put to the jail, you know, they prosecuted and they got years in the jail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they don't know how to react when there is a clear political prosecution and punishment, but on a faster manner, manner and you know, when it's very, very fast, but it still uh, prevent people from doing politics. It still prevent them for expressing their views. It still prevent them to participate in social lives. And that's, I mean, of course, I like idea. You know, I mean, five years ago, Belarus has uh, way more people in jail. And I like the fact that right now is just two and I hope they will be released and we will have no more at all. But as a, as, as political organization, I understand that when we talk about the development, it should be the way when if you want to participate in social life of your city, of your country, even we have alternative view and you want to express, what, express it peacefully, you cannot be punished for this. And uh, as, as, but I want, to st I want to stress here one important point, which I think is sometimes is under, uh, uh, underestimated, that our elites, I could say about tell about Belarus, but I think it's most about post-Soviet elites, even those who are now treated as democratic, but still. We came from a different, they came from a different tradition. They came from a different, fully different perception of what is human rights, how you should deal with this, how you should solve the issues. That's why sometimes when you talk to talk to them, you know, you should clearly understand you should clearly understand this, how different they are. Let's say Sometimes they do things they even don't feel they do wrong. They are fully, uh, act fully okay and right within terms and conditions. They were, uh, let's say, uh, uh, brought, up. brought up, you know. They, it's, 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 they fully adequate to the system. And that's why I, I think that's how it's important this dialogue, you know when you explain once more and once more and once again and again and again, involving them to this, explaining them the different perception, you know. Otherwise, and I, I finish here, and otherwise I think we could, yes, we could have m no people in the jail because, for example, of political activists, but we can get businessmen into jail because state just need money. And they put them to the jail, mm -hmm. taking the money and say, this is bribes, this is corruption, taking the money and let them out. But it's it's is it political for me? Yes, because it's, it's freedom of businesses. Is you know it's 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 as well politics. Yes. So and that's what we have today sometimes in Belarus. So I think that's that's why we need to see on it broader. You know, and we need to have this permanent dialogue about about those kind of issues. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, three minutes left of the seminar. Uh, so if. Uh, Alexander Ngigi has one, two sentences. Uh, you can share that as just, well. Just really a couple of sentences. Uh, I absolutely agree that the pressure became more sophisticated. For instance, uh, uh, Alexei Navalny is being usually put into prison under administrative arrest for 30 days. Then he's been released for 10 days, 15 days, 20 days. Then again, administrative arrest for 30 days. <coughs> That's how they uh, do that right now. And they put a lot of fines on ordinary people, so ordinary people do not take part in, uh, in, in any action. So uh, they uh, do that in a, very, in a very sophisticated way and in administrative way, not in a criminal way. They no longer put a lot of people to prison for uh, long term, so they just, they just use administrative code. And you, 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 uh, this is impossible to, to hold a campaign when you spend every second day in administrative arrest. This is how they do that. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'd just like to uh, thank you again to raise this uh, uh, very important and, and painful uh, problem. Uh, and uh, we all have to, to remember that we may uh, talk, we may act, we may try but uh, to, to release these people, but uh, uh, we, we have to be, uh, be very so sober and no, not to forget because uh, each one day, additional day, for those people who suffer in prison, 
uh, for, for, for them it, it's a thousand times painful and we, we can't uh, imagine uh, what, what, what does it mean once you uh, yourself not uh, uh, live with that. So that's, that, that's why uh, uh, once additionally I would like to thank you uh, to paying the attention to, to this, uh, this problem and we have to be very consistent uh, uh, in that regard uh, because uh, as I told you it's a very human hu it's the most human <laughs> issue that uh, the, for example it's, it's very difficult when you are s sitting in the prison you won the uh, human rights court and you still you are in prison because uh, uh, there is uh, after the human rights court is, is I, I don't know the uh, the clouds and the god, and uh, in spite that you won and you uh, you uh, waited for the, uh, for 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 that result uh, for years for two three years and still you are in prison and uh, this makes you s s such a big disappointment that uh, uh, I even can't describe. So so that's why. We have to do our best to, to, to finish this uh, madness, not only in Georgia, but also in our neighbor countries in Eastern Europe, uh, in order to, to have the new, mm, uh, to, to go on the new level. Uh, uh, because the countries with political prisoners, uh, I don't see the, the bright future for the such countries. And unfortunately, I'm talking on, on my, my country, but uh, we have to do our best to finish this. Thank you very much. And uh, I, of course, uh, want to end this very, very interesting and uh, insightful seminar by uh, just thanking the three of you for being here in Stockholm, sharing your stories, your experience, your knowledge. Uh, this is obviously an extremely fundamental part of the rule of law and of any open and free society. Uh, so thank you very much for being here, and uh, thank you for the good question. Uh, so uh, thanks uh, one more time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.